care of everything. And again, so excited to, to welcome Dr. Subramanian. Um, if you could maybe uh, just give a quick intro of yourself and then I'll start your slides. Sure. So um, welcome everyone. I think we have a sizable group, some faces on the line and some probably voices later. Um, I'm excited to participate in this and it's sort of a launch to potentially some other more deeper dives into integrative medicine um, in the future. Uh, we're hoping to do perhaps um, work with PMD Alliance to do a quarterly, um, you know, topic uh, could be acupuncture, could be yoga, could be um, meditation, mindfulness, could be um, more about self-care. I'm going to be covering some self-care stuff as an overview today. Um, could be many things. So um, definitely want to get your feedback on what topics you'd like. And um, I'll probably try to facilitate those with a speaker, um, likely a doctor who's knowledgeable about this as the first go around. And as we sort of roll these out, um, and if it's exciting and, and um, there's an interest to people, we may expand to people outside of just um, regular physicians and include um, some other folks as well. So um, I think that this is a very topical topic. Um, I, I um, just a, in terms of a background, so I'm a movement disorder neurologist. I'm basically a Parkinson's doctor. I run our center of excellence here at the VA in the Southwest. So I cover um, the Southwest area of the US. There's six centers of excellence in the veterans um, affairs. And so I run one of those uh, centers. And I also work at UCLA a little bit. Um, and I've had a, a long-standing practice, largely at UCLA and at the VA, um, for probably the last, the last 16, 18 years um, since I was a, a movement fellow. Um, and uh, in that time, I feel like um, I've gotten a good sense of what um, is helpful in terms of medications and treatments that we have, especially for motor issues. I have a sense of what the surgical aspects help. But I really feel, felt like there was an unmet need in terms of other sorts of um, uh, areas of medicine that are not regular Western medicines. And so I started to get involved in um, a yoga sort of practice myself. It was really helpful for me. I had um, worked part-time, um, you know, in these different clinics and then also had three children over a span of about six, seven years and was feeling a lot of stress and um, trying to balance things, get good night's sleep and try to, you know, kind of um, organize my day with all the things I had to work around. And I felt like I needed something outside of just the routine things that I had um, in my regular armamentarium. So I ended up uh, reaching out and doing some yoga, got interested in yoga and started a mindfulness practice as well. It really helped me. And I started to attract a lot of younger women uh, patients in my practice at UCLA. And even as I started chatting with people, even older patients, even men, um, it really seemed like people were interested in things that were outside of the conventional, um, you know, Western approaches. So I ended up um, doing a yoga teacher training. I then learned how to teach some mindfulness and um, expanded that. And last year I actually got boarded in integrative medicine and took some um, time to take some um, other courses around this field. I've been going to meetings in that arena and trying to really marry the two worlds. So the Parkinson's disease movement disorders world along with the integrative medicine world. And I think that I feel pretty confident that I um, can speak intelligently about these two areas. And I'm hoping to kind of bridge the gap between, um, you know, Western trained doctors who are movement disorder docs and the sort of out outside practitioners that may be in, um, you know, your midst. And, and honestly, patients, whether or not we as Western trained doctors are appreciative of this, 40 to 60% of Parkinson's patients are seeking um, what historically has been complementary and an alternative medicines um, approaches. And now we, we term this field integrative medicine. And so I think that this is something that um, people are hungry for uh, support groups, after support groups. Um, you know, there's a lot of advocacy groups, a lot of folks asking patients what they're interested in learning about and hearing about. And this is a topic that comes up time and time again. And so I think the PMD Alliance has been pretty, um, uh, on top of that and uh, approached me and some other folks to try to um, roll out something that's a little bit more of a deeper dive um, that would run um, as a separate sort of, uh, um, I guess, a video conference to the uh, current uh, Lunch with Docs, but hopefully can, can also fill in some blanks that may not have been covered so far. So that's kind of where uh, we're coming from. And so I just wanted to spend some time just over some slides that will hopefully help everybody understand kind of what these terms mean. And then also um, 
talk a little bit about self-care, which I think is important, not only for the patients out there, doctors out there, providers out there, also the, the um, people who are um, caregivers and, and, and family members of Parkinson's patients. I think all of these things can be helpful to all of us and, and should be things that we think about all the time. So I'm just gonna run through a few slides and then um, we can open it up a little bit more and, and talk. I know this is a pretty interactive kind of dialogue, I think is what the hope is. And so I wanted to just sort of start with a few a bit of an overview and and hopefully we will be able to answer specific questions about each of these areas in the next couple of years as we roll out the sort of um, deeper dive as well so you even if you have questions and we don't get to them today we'll we'll try to cover them in future topics so my the title of my my talk is living well with parkinson's disease i'm going to talk a little bit about integrative medicine and also spend more time on the self-care kind of aspects so maybe you can advance the slide Okay, so it's important to think about medicine these days as not just the Western traditional medicines that we, we have traditionally been taught in medical school. And I think even medical schools, and I think out in Arizona, there's a huge um, interest in this, um, you know, Andrew Wiles out there. There's a lot of Western trained docs that have really grown into these areas. Um, and so these days we're talking about a field historically referred to as complementary and alternative medicine. Now we're talking rather than as an alternate to medicines, we're really talking about integrative medicine, which is really about integrating the two areas. So we're talking about Western treatments alongside of these other approaches and trying to use these, um, the best of both worlds. Can we go back to that first slide? Sorry. No worries. <laughs> Yeah, there you go. All right, so we're, a lot of these um, approaches and in the integrative medicine approaches is, is looking at how the body itself can innately heal itself rather than relying on something that's going to be a cure. And as we all know in Parkinson's, Parkinson's is a chronic neurodegenerative disease. We have not identified a cure. And I think this innate healing, the trying to build resilience, trying to build ways that the body can function with um, adaptation and trying to sort of use the mind and the body to kind of um, work together to help the body to overcome some of these issues, especially in the non-motor realm, is really something that we have to open our minds to. And so I just wanted to emphasize, you know, even the World Health Organization, and this is a pretty old definition of health, is looking not just as um, health as a uh, uh, a mere absence of disease or infirmity, but really that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. And so we really have to kind of think more holistically about health and not just you have this one, you know, weak limb and that we're going to fix that, or you have um, a, a like an infection and we're gonna give you an antibiotic. And a disease like Parkinson's, it requires a much more holistic approach. And I think that this is where we can kind of emphasize things like lifestyle, emphasize things like self-care and really look outside the box of what we traditionally offer. Oh, sorry. Uh oh, um, can you go to the next slide? Sorry. Okay. So, um, so when we think about um, the integrative medicine approaches, it's important to know that from a safety perspective, these things are not to replace conventional therapies whole, whole, wholeheartedly. So I still believe that something like Cinemet, uh, dopamine replacement is very essential. And we're really talking about using some of these integrative approaches to talk about things that are in the non-motor realm, I think largely is where the money is. So things like anxiety, depression, apathy. So apathy is really when patients lack motivation. All of these things are very common in our patients. Up to 40% of our patients get each of these things that I've mentioned. Sleep is another thing that a lot of our patients battle with. Constipation is a huge problem in almost all of our patients' mm -hmm. cognition. So I feel like these are some areas where we can really try to rely on these integrative approaches. It's important to remember that safety is still of concern. If you're using something like a herb just because it comes from a plant, these are still very potent medication or, or or uh, compounds. And something like St. John's wort, in fact, has a lot of drug-drug interactions. And so you want to make sure that you are telling your doctors, your Western doctors, and everyone is understanding what all you're actually on, because some of these medicines can actually um, react negatively with the Parkinson's medicines or other medicines that you may be on. 
It's also important to remember that the, these preparations, and I often get asked about, for example, um, you know, certain types of supplements or even marijuana these days, things like that. And a lot of these things are not FDA regulated at all. And so you're kind of at the mercy of whoever is preparing it. And often if you go back sometimes the next week or the next month, there may be some alterations in what's actually in the supplement. Or, you know, if you switch from one supplement to another brand, there may be huge variations in what's in there. It's also important to be cautious. I think that there's a lot of hype out there. And one of the things that I've really spent a lot of time talking to groups about, I was just in a women's focus group. And a lot of these patients are saying that they just really are worried that there's so much of a barrage of information out there on the internet that they really are unclear of how to filter this. And sometimes your doctor can actually be helpful. But one of the things that I think is, is sort of an alarm bell right off the bat is if something's very expensive, if something offers a cure, to a disease that we know that there isn't a cure for, or if it seems too good to be true. So if it treats like every disorder known to man, then it's unlikely that it's probably going to, you know, really truly help your Parkinson's disease. So I think we have to be mindful of claims out there and just be really, um, you know, uh, understanding of what uh, the potential is to lose money and be taken for a ride in these situations too. So again, I think that's where the role of talking to your Western trained physicians is important in keeping them in the loop. Next slide. So when talking to patients, as I mentioned, I spent a lot of time talking to support groups and things like that. Patients want to have told us that they want to decrease the pill burden. They want some guidance on what wellness and stress management strategies to incorporate in their lives. And I know that, for example, in a place like LA where you have literally 10 different types of uh, Parkinson's exercise groups. So Parkinson's boxing, dance for Parkinson's, you know, all, yoga for Parkinson's. There's, there's so much out there. And I think some patients just feel like they have to do every single thing. And sometimes they actually get stressed out about hyper scheduling their lives. And I often am trying to tell them, you know, there has to be a balance. So again, I think we want to be mindful of what all we're asking ourselves to do. And, you know, pick a few things that really bring you joy, bring you um, some social aspects of things, and not try to go from one thing to another all day long, one doctor's visit to another all day long. That makes life, you know, really quite stressful. And that's not the goal of anybody who's trying to treat you, I don't think so. Um, as I mentioned, patients want guidance to filter the hope versus hype in social media. Um, there's also been a sense that patients want guidance to how to to talk to their healthcare providers. And I think that healthcare providers and healthcare systems, unfortunately, are under a lot of stress to make things more efficient, make visits shorter. And so how to best manage your time in those visits and allow your doctor to understand what all treatments you may be on is often tough. And so I find that making lists out, sometimes even sending some information before the visit to the physician so that they can sometimes review it. If there's nurses there, if there's other um, healthcare, uh, you know, sort of um, personnel, sometimes in involving them so that you can really get the best level of communication. Because I think that if you end up as the visit is wrapping down and the doctor has their hand on the, the door ready to leave, and then you start asking seven questions about some of these things that haven't been brought up, it often doesn't go very well. So I think being prepared and coming there, but I think most doctors definitely wanna know about all the things that you're putting in your body and what all you know sorts of um, alternative approaches you may be using. So I think it's important that we be able to to communicate um, some of these things better. Patients have also talked about having a roadmap of what to expect in their Parkinson's future and help guiding their care partners. And also I think there's been some issues with us as physicians um, not being able to fully understand all the things, especially that women, for example, with Parkinson's uh, may be going through in terms of um, issues with uh, identity, uh, quality of life, the definition of health, um, how patients may want to advocate for themselves and empower themselves. And so I think that we as a medical community hopefully are starting to expand our horizons a little bit and understand some of these things. And I think even in the setting of, for example, physician burnout, so a lot of us are worried that our medical students, our residents, our um, colleagues in medicine are burning out. And so there's been some increasing interest in some of these lifestyle and self-care approaches, even for physicians um, themselves to try to use to help them with 
this sort of life uh, balance. Um, so I think that that can sometimes translate if a physician's embodying it and they feel better like I have, then I'm going to be more likely to try to speak to my patients about it. So I think it's important to connect with doctors that may be um, like-minded in the things that you're interested in as well. Um, next slide. All right, so a couple last slides. Um, I just wanted to write a couple of things down that I feel are important um, as, uh, as a Parkinson's doc. So pearls of Parkinson's disease wellness. So one thing is that I feel that it's really important to have empowerment. Patients need to feel like they're in some control of their future. And I think if you get educated, if you get um, on these sorts of groups or even in-person groups, if you ask the right questions, if you, it really takes some education and empowerment, and so you have to advocate for yourself. And so sometimes when we end up drizzling in some of these lifestyle strategies, it makes people feel like they're in control of some of these things in the day-to-day -day life, and it can actually make people feel a lot better. So empowerment is really key. I think it's important as a patient and as somebody, any, any one of us actually, I think some of these things are important, to ask yourself, what is your purpose and what brings you joy? I think that's very different for each of us. And if we try to um, use a one, um, one type of method uh, for all the patients that come in, we're really gonna be missing what's important to each of our patients. I know I have some women who are um, grandmothers that wanna, their whole purpose is to take care of their grandchildren or to play with the grandchild or to you know, bake them a cake at Easter or something like that. So if that's what brings you joy, it's important that your doctor understand that it's not running a marathon or walking, you know, a thousand miles. It's really that specific activity. So you have to think about what's your purpose and what brings you joy. It's also important to think about what your goals of care are and what defines health to you. So for some people, if they're horribly constipated, that's much worse than if they have a tremor. That may not be that bothersome. But the things that we've historically learned to focus on in Parkinson's, and especially if you're not seeing necessarily a movement disorder trained neurologist, the types of things that we focus on are the motor aspects like, you know, tremor or stiffness. And we're really missing what's most important to you and your healthcare definition and what your goal of care might be. So it's really important to try to bring to your physician's um, uh, uh, sort of awareness what is actually matters to you, what your goal of your health is. And so it's important then for that person to try to help customize a healthcare approach to you. And the healthcare team does not necessarily stop at that, you know, 15 minute follow up with the doctor. I think that there's a lot of people out there that can also be um, your cheerleaders in this world of um, trying to figure out how you're going to navigate the Parkinson's. So be it a physical therapist, a yoga teacher, a Tai Chi teacher, a psychologist, a nurse, it may be a number of people. It might even be your support group leader or other patients. So I think it's important to think about who is in your team that may be able to give you um, some ability to navigate you know, this disease. It's also so important to be socially connected and I can't emphasize this enough. Um, and I think that's, it's so cool that we have this Zoom capability because I think we can feel even if we're isolated somewhere um, geographically or can't get out of our homes that you know, we, we can see each other and we're even virtually socially connected. This uh, social connection is probably the most important prognostic indicator for people with Parkinson's and as we age with good aging. So getting out there making social connections, keeping social connections um, really is so important. And I think that support groups are you know, a way to get some of this in, group exercise classes, things like that. So really, really important to stay socially connected. And then um, finding an advocate. So figuring out who your cheerleader is. And it may not be, you know, somebody who you would think. It might not be your son. It might not be your husband. It might not be, you know, um, somebody who you would ordinarily think. It might be your sister. It might be your sorority sister. It might be, you know, it might be somebody who you would never, your neighbor. It's just important to figure out who's going to be your ally and bring them along to visits if you can, bring them to support group meetings if you can. Try to involve them in your care so that, you know, as you navigate this disease, I've had a lot of patients who come in alone every visit, visit after visit, come in alone. And as I see, you know, them aging and even, you know, as all of us age, it's important to sort of um, plan for the worst and hope for the best. So you really want to include somebody else who's listened to sort of the counseling that your physician's given you, 
helped you navigate things and can help you make decisions as things um, proceed in the disease. So I think that that is something that I really want to emphasize to figure out even early on who's going to be your sort of cheerleader and who your tribe is. These are two things that I think we, we don't stress enough. And then I think I have one last slide, maybe one or two, I can't remember. All right, so self-care. Um, these are things that your mother told you, right? And mom was always right, I guess. So important, few things, sleep. So trying to get eight hours if you can. And we're seeing that even in dementia research, uh, aging research, longevity research, that sleep is like when your memories get cemented, this is when you detoxify things in your brain. And it's like floss for your brain, basically, is what people have talked about. It's when all those bad proteins are getting you know, cleaned out. So really important to get a good night's sleep, all in a row if you can. This disrupted sleep of naps and things like that, probably not so helpful. Um, hydration, so a lot of our medications can drop blood pressure. A lot of you guys live in desert sort of climates in Arizona, California, important to hydrate. So we say if there's no medical contraindication, try to drink at least like something like 40, 44 ounces of water a day. Exercise is so key and that's, um, you know, across the board, exercise is medicine. And we work really closely with a lot of exercise groups, a lot of physical therapy folks. And I truly believe that exercise may be the most important thing that we, we offer our patients with Parkinson's, probably even better than medicines or surgeries or anything else out there. Diet, diet is very key in, in aging as well. Um, probably the best type of diet is, um, probably the very best diet would be a whole food plant-based diet. But if you can't adhere to that, Mediterranean diet with lots of, lots of fresh fruits and vegetables, um, low, low fat, you know, sort of um, lots and lots of colorful vegetables, definitely the way to go. So going to the doctor is also important. And this is those stands for even caregivers as well. If you can't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of anybody else? And I think a lot of the times, especially women with Parkinson's or women caregivers, we put ourselves sometimes last. And so if you miss your own doctor's appointments, if you miss your own mammograms and screens and stuff, um, then it's going to be very hard for you to be able to take care of anyone else. So that is something that I really want to stress as well. And then staying mentally stimulated. So learning a new language, learning um, maybe to play a new instrument, things like that, dancing, things that you sort of are a little out of the box. The brain needs to be constantly stimulated even until late aging stages. So anything you can do to mix it up is really um, helpful. All right, and I can, do I have one more? Yeah, one more, okay. So last slide is on the mind-body approach. And this is really my passion. This is my happy place. And uh, we can perhaps spend a little bit more time in, in one of those deeper dive sessions talking about this. So there's been a lot of research on the mind and the body's connection. And so I mentioned the social connection. We already talked about that. Mindfulness and meditation are often very helpful. And there's been studies coming out about how mindfulness can help with um, even 20 minutes a day or even less than that sometimes can help with um, dementia, with aging. And it's, I believe that it's going to be quite powerful. We don't have a lot of studies in this realm for treating anxiety and mood in Parkinson's. Another area, um, breathing and yoga. So in regular yoga, which I'm a big fan of and have a lot of patients who do really, really well with um, yoga, uh, is is mixed there's a mix of yoga which are often what people think about are the asanas so the poses then there's the breathing work that's also part of it and then the meditative aspect so you get all three if you have a good yoga practice and so i believe that these three things together and possibly you know in 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 parts as well so if you just did the breathing i think these are very powerful for non-motor issues. And there was just a study published in JAMA Neurology that I was asked to look at. And um, this was a study out of Hong Kong and they showed that it actually helps this package of these three things, the poses, the breath work, and the meditation are very powerful to help non-motor issues like anxiety and depression is what this study showed. So I think there will be many more studies um, to show this in the future. Other things that are hot, topics in integrative medicine right now. So nature, getting out into nature. There's a sense that nature, um, being around trees, being around plants, that these um, living organisms release some sort of chemicals that are helpful and, and actually um, help our health. 
And so go, there's a Japanese tradition of forest bathing. A lot of people like to go hiking or gardening. These are likely very good things to do for your um, aging as well as likely for Parkinson's as well. As part of um, the mind-body practices, um, there's uh, certain practices around gratitude, loving kindness, and forgiveness. And I really think that these are very helpful to reflect on what we have. And this is not only for the patient, but for the caregiver. And often just starting your day with a gratitude practice, thinking about three things that you're very thankful for can really set your tone of the day and can be very, very helpful for the rest of your day. Journaling is helpful. For those who are spiritual, praying, if you have a you know, church group that you like to go with, that's actually been shown to be very helpful, that social aspect and the spiritual connections that you form. Volunteering, so that's actually a huge thing that helping other people can be very, very beneficial for oneself. Getting out and kind of playing a bit, singing a bit, dancing a bit, you know, sort of letting the sort of stress out in different ways that you may have thought of having fun as a child or as a teenager, a lot of those things can still be really fun even as an adult. And so I think it's just really important to get that bucket list out and um, not save it for a rainy day and start checking things off. And if it means, you know, telling people that you love, that you love them, calling an old friend, um, forgiving somebody that might have hurt you a long time ago, really just starting to get, you know, all the things that you might be weighed down around off your chest. I think it can be very freeing and really help. And I've had patients who really imbibed and embodied these practices that come back and tell us that they're in, honestly, after the diagnosis of Parkinson's, the best state of physical and mental health that they've ever been in their lives. So I think that's kind of exciting. And so you have the power to do this for yourself and you just need to figure out how, again, to get that team aligned to help you with that. So this is sort of an overview of self-care and a little bit on integrative medicine, I think we can maybe um, chat about questions or I don't know if there's specific things that you wanted to talk about. And I also don't know what the time is. I haven't figured out that. Let me check a look. Yeah, so it is 12.25. So we have um, a good 30 minutes or so to do questions. Um, and I love this first question from Mark. You know, you talked, Dr. Supermanian, about being empowered and walking in that doctor's appointment and taking charge. And even in this question, um, Mark is, I'm just going to read it because he lays out all his details and then goes right to his question. So Mark's tremor dominant medication recalcitrant PD patient. He has had no noticeable benefit from Cinemet, but DBS has been life changing. His question is that he used to be proud of his ability to do one leg balance poses in yoga, and now he loses his balance in some two-legged poses even. Mm. So he does find yoga an aid uh, to address balance issues and wants to know if you could discuss the various parts of balance and what gets hindered in PD. Yeah. So that's a complex question. So I'm not too sure where, so, so backing up. Tremor-dominant Parkinson's patients often have largely tremor. Cinemet is not always a helpful drug for tremor, and it's probably the symptom that we treat out of the classic symptoms of tremor, rigidity, and akinesia the worst. So rigidity is like stiffness, and akinesia is slowness. And so those two symptoms, the stiffness and slowness, are very robust treated with cinnamon. The tremor, not so much. And so the fact that cinnamon didn't help the tremor is not horribly surprising. DBS is a good treatment for stiffness, slowness, and tremor actually in some occasions. I, we don't necessarily always do DBS if, if a patient just has tremor and nothing else. I don't, you know, the, often we don't chase the tremor when we're treating patients in, with Parkinson's because the tremor is often a rest tremor and may not get in the way of their daily life. It's a nuisance, but it's not really something, it actually gets better when they go to eat or drink. So, so I think that in general, tremor is something that we no, don't necessarily cha chase and we also don't necessarily um, you know, have benefit with levodopa. So, but as the disease progresses in classic Parkinson's, as uh, you know, the, the years go on, some of the symptoms um, are not well treated with DBS. So the things that are not often, you know, if you follow a patient over time, there are certain symptoms like balance, sometimes like freezing, sometimes like speech and swallowing. 
the cognitive issues, the, psych, the, the mood issues, these things are not treated with DBS. And so it may be that as the disease has progressed in, um, I think it was Mike, um, that we're now seeing balance issues that are not tackled by DBS. And so it may still be a consideration to try medication at this point, go back to your primary care doctor or primary neurologist and see about the medications that may have helped with the motor symptoms of Parkinson's like cinnamon. And, see, and I would retry that possibly for balance. Some of the issues though in Parkinson's as the disease progresses with balance are not helped with medication even. And often we're relying on things like um, uh, work done with physical therapy and they can really tease out why the balance is a problem. Balance is complex because balance can be um, from a few things. Sometimes people have certain motor issues like stiffness and slowness or dyskinesia that affects balance. If you're not having stiffness, slowness, or dyskinesia that's kind of pushing you off your, um, your ability to balance, then it, that may not be your problem. A, number, a second issue is that some patients get orthostatic hypotension. So that means that their blood pressure drops when they go from a sitting to a standing position. And that can be even off of medication. And so sometimes we still, um, you know, we need to be mindful of blood pressure medicines, hydration and things like that. And so you have to figure out, is that something that you're having affect you while you're in your yoga class? And certainly in yoga, I try to avoid heat. Um, I don't think hot yoga is great for Parkinson's patients because they can actually pass out even in, in the worst situations if they get really dehydrated and their blood pressure is dropped in, in heat. Um, and so you, you want to look at that as well. And then if it's not these couple of things, another issue though is as the disease progresses, there are innate balance issues that come in from the balance centers in Parkinson's. And we don't have good treatments for that outside of working with a physical therapist to see um, if they can kind of guide you with certain exercises, practicing, trying to practice slowly. Sometimes patients who may have had a yoga practice 10 years ago, and then they retry it with Parkinson's in, in the setting of Parkinson's are often quite hard on them. So they're like, well, I used to be able to do this when I was 20 and now I'm like 50. Why can't I do the same stuff? Well, it's, you know, there are a lot of things that I think the body changes around. And so I think getting perhaps a knowledgeable instructor and slowly easing into it um, would be something that I would definitely recommend. But I think going back to basics and trying to re-look at the, the balance issue, if you're not on any medicines, I think there's still a role for treatments um, in the Western realm with um, you know, something like levodopa in this setting. Okay. And I think, um, so you mentioned hot yoga has some, uh, causes some concerns. Um, Laura wants to know if there is a best type of yoga for people with Parkinson's. And then there's also the question, are inversions inherently dangerous for people with Parkinson's? Okay, that's a good question. So I think that, um, you know, it depends on what you like and what you enjoy and what you can do. I think that entering into, if you can try to start, depending on your state, and I think that one of the issues in studying this uh, yoga in Parkinson's historically has been that we've kind of come up with protocols that are supposed to be like a one, one, one shop fits all kind of situation. And, you know, as the disease changes, you could go from having literally no motor symptoms to sometimes having serious issues with balance and needing help getting out of a chair or off the floor, for example. So mixing too many people in a classroom and trying to do everything the same for everybody is often not very helpful. And as I mentioned, there are certain types of yoga um, approaches that may help the non-motor issues like anxiety and depression, those are gonna be much more slow and meditative sometimes and breath work related than something that's going to help from a stretching perspective or a cardio perspective in terms of the flow. So, so I think there's, there are many types of yoga out there. And if you can work with somebody who's knowledgeable at Parkinson's, we're actually, I'm working with a patient uh, slash yoga teacher, whose name is Richard Rosen, who's been a yoga, yoga teacher for a very long time and is at Parkinson's for 15 years. We're designing a yoga teacher training and we're gonna be rolling it out hopefully quite soon for, for yoga teachers who are interested in working with yoga with, with Parkinson's patients. And I think that that type of training, if a teacher goes to that, they should be able to help guide you as to, from your perspective, what you're trying to get out of it, what are your symptoms? And so in this training that we've 
created, we're looking at three stages of disease, early, middle, and late, and then four classes of symptoms. One, one class includes anxiety and depression. The second includes just balance. The third is um, stiffness of the upper body. And then the fourth is sort of stiffness and, and um, issues in the lower body. So we're sequencing specific poses around your stage of disease as well as you know what your issues are um, symptom wise kind of like a physical therapist might so we're trying to think a little bit more intelligently whereas I think if you just go to like a you know a fitness center and take the class that everyone takes um, it's going to be much harder for you to figure out you know am I doing this right is this safe for me in terms of inversions, um, so I don't have a specific, like it's not like Hatha Yoga or Iyengar. I think, I, I think there are positives of, of Vinyasa. I mean, there's so many different types of yoga out there. I think if you can find a yoga practice that includes the poses um, and stretching, includes the breath work and includes meditation and has a teacher that understands something about the disease, I think then, then you're in a good space. And also has some social aspects. I think then you're going to get that other checkbox of getting some social interaction is, is important. So that's what I would say. The question about inversions is a good one. So some people have actually thought that inversions are good for the nervous system because they change CSF flow and, and other things. So if you were super early in disease and had a very strong yoga practice, it may be that you can continue to try to do those. I personally think as um, patients have balance issues, uh, we have blood pressure regulation issues, that inversions can be tough and should be supervised. So you may be able to modify some of these things and get some sense, you know, doing a, a, like a Hand, like a headstand or something uh, against the wall or, or a shoulder stand against the wall, something like that. Um, maybe um, helpful if you have somebody spotting you, but you want to really enter into these things with somebody to watch you, some guidance, um, and knowing exactly how your hydration status is because it, those are definitely um, going to affect blood pressure pretty strongly. And if you have balance issues, it can also affect that pretty strongly as well. We, would, we don't want anyone to fall or pass out. That's our, not our goal of yoga. Definitely. Um, okay, the next question is about walking barefoot. I know you mentioned forest bathing. Yeah. But question wondered if you've heard any chatter or research about the benefits of walking barefoot. Yeah, so I think this is kind of hot these days. Um, I think that, you know, getting in touch with the ground, with the, you know, the grass, and I did some, um, I did this uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction um, training, and uh, uh, one part of that is this, um, they have a walking meditation, um, and so you, you are often walking uh, and we were lucky at the VA, we have a pretty garden in, in Los Angeles and we were, you know, walking. It wasn't, it, some part of it was barefoot because we did yoga on the grass and I thought that was pretty lovely because, um, you know, we were feeling, you know, the, the sort of grass under our feet and the coolness and it was a contrast between that and the area around was, had a lot of um, leaves that had fallen off the tree and some seeds and things and there was crunching and, you know, so you're basically using all your senses, you're hearing it, you're um, feeling it with your feet, you're feeling, um, you're smelling the, the flowers. And I think it really, you know, gets us grounded back to where, you know, we are as human beings on this planet Earth um, that we kind of forget about when we're always on our devices and cell phones and stuff when we're kind of checked out. Um, so I personally think that it's not, I mean, if you can tolerate it and you have a clean environment, um, you know, you can be in a grassy place or, you know, um, something that, that brings you joy, do it. Why not? I like it. Okay, I'm, uh, I might mispronounce these supplements, but um, Lauren's wondering what your thoughts are on gluathione treatment, treatment mm -hmm. and NAC. Do you know yeah. what that is? Yeah. She also spelled it out. Okay. Yeah, I do know what they are. Um, I think that the person who knows the most about this is a colleague of mine, um, Lori Mishley. Um, and she's been doing some studies around intranasal glutathione. Um, there's been some hype about glutathione over the years. Um, there was some, some media uh, videos out about IV infusions of glutathione, um, as well as um, some thoughts, exciting thoughts about taking a lot of NAC and things like that. I, from the last in, information that I know, and I don't want to misquote her, my understanding is that they are doing the studies on glutathione in intranasal. One of the issues is trying to get glutathione into the brain in adequate levels, because there's a lot of issues with um, transportation in 
past the blood brain barrier. And so um, my understanding is that this, this intranasal glutathione is likely the most um, effective, although they're still studying this and trying to get a sense of where and how to use it. The IV infusion um, stuff, I, I think a lot of folks thought that it was the motor improvements were so rapid that there was just really a lot of placebo effects. So I personally am not recommending patients do any of this right now with the current data. NAC, which is N-acetylcysteine, my sense from hearing what Lori had said was that there was some downside um, of that, that there was actually a negative um, impact of that on symptoms from some surveys and studies that she had done. So I think that we, um, we still don't fully know. And so I think, you know, um, when we don't know and there might be some harm, it's probably better to wait for the data to come out because um, these are things that are being actively studied right now. But there's a lot of other, you know, antioxidants and things that we can get just from nutrition, good nutrition, um, you know, as we talked about, you know, um, sometimes chia seeds, you know, omega-3 things, uh, fruits, lots of fruits and vegetables have antioxidant properties. So I think, you know, the, the goal of trying to help cells be happy um, may be achieved the best from their natural forms, you know, in, in a good diet. Very good. Um, next question. I would love for my father to do everything on your list of mind body suggestions. Yeah. However, he's racked with apathy and has never been someone who tries new things. Do you have any advice? Well, one question I think that is important to, and I, you know, remember that I take care of a lot of veterans who are like in their 70s and 80s. So people are always like, wow, you're an integrative medicine, open minded doctor who is sitting at a VA talking to you know elderly men who probably aren't interested in anything you have to say and actually I'm a bit blown away by how open-minded some of our patients are and actually bring things to me on a regular basis and the VA system for example um, has a, a big interest in opening uh, their minds to what we call whole health and so I think what's important in that setting is to really drill down on what what is something that is a goal for him and you know what even if it's, you know, that he wants to, you know, go with you and your child to their play or I don't know, something like, or, you know, maybe walk somebody down an aisle at a wedding or, you know, some, or go to a birthday celebration of, you know, their sister in a year. That's, you know, a special celebration. So I think using that type of carrot can sometimes motivate people to say, you know, remember you were the one who wanted to go to this or that. And, you know, we're trying to, you know, pave the way for you to do that because this was your hope and dream. So I think sometimes in apathy, that's helpful. Unfortunately, in apathy, we don't have a great treatment for it. And it's something that I think um, my hope is actually that some of the breath work um, in yoga, there's a lot of things that are a bit energizing. And Dr. Weil actually has some cool um, breathing exercise that can be um, downloaded. Uh, there's one that's calming and then there's one that's a bit energizing. So Andrew Weil, maybe we can give them some resources at the end of this. Um, but we don't have any medication. We don't have any great, you know, sort of treatments for apathy. So it's really about trying to come up with bite-sized goals. And even if it's, you know, um, I think setting too large a goal becomes insurmountable. People don't even want to start anywhere. The other thing that I would say is that if you can think about maybe, or your dad can think about what he liked doing as a child or what brought him joy as a teenager, kind of if he had free time, was it, you know, going out and hanging out in, in the garden or in a forest or, you know, going to, um, I don't know what, whatever it is, the baseball game or whatever, you know, starting with small things that kind of almost bring back some memories of a happier time sometimes can really trigger positive emotions that can then motivate people to want to, you know, stay in the game a little bit more and, and try different things. So it's not necessarily about, you know, the things that work for me, because, you know, yoga may not work for everybody. It might be that they want to do just something else. Maybe it's um, boxing. And I think rock steady boxing is a really cool thing for some men because they really, you know, sometimes in, if for veterans, the boxing was part of some fun training that they did, getting out there and, you know, taking their aggression out on the box the bag or whatever um, can really be something that resonates with them. So I would think maybe show him lists of a few things, try not to overwhelm him, figure out what his goal is from a healthcare perspective, and then try to do bite-sized pieces to achieve that so that he has little wins along the way, I think is really the goal. And the important thing also for caregivers is to not take it personally when 
when that all doesn't work. Because I think we, we sit there and I think this is tremendously hard for people who work uh, with apathetic you know, loved ones, spouses or whatever, um, is that they, you know, oh, my doctor gave this list. The doctor gave this list of all the things you're supposed to be doing. You don't want to do any of them. And I'm sitting here trying to motivate you. And so I'm the bad guy because you aren't doing this and I'm not able to get you to do this. So you, ha you cannot take that personally. I mean, that's a lot of, this is part of the disease. And even though we as physicians ask that we have an ally, it's not, this is, you didn't sign up to be somebody's, you know, personal trainer. <laughs> Absolutely. That's great advice on many levels and interesting that and um, so glad you shared that the VA has that. Uh, yeah. Starting with that focus. Yeah. Cool. Um, next question. Do you have any news on the nilotinib study? Okay. That's not really in my realm. I think it's still pending. Yeah, but um, presumably there will be better speakers equipped to that. But I know that they were in some later phase, like three or something like that. And I think, you know, we're waiting to hear. But yeah, that, wouldn't, that, would, that would definitely be, it's, a, it's an anti-cancer drug. I, even though we're talking about things that are not standard Western practice, I'm, I'm not sure that that would fully fit into the integrated medicine universe. At least I don't think it would, but yeah. <laughs> I have heard you can buy it on the internet from, uh, from Asia. So maybe yeah, we're not, we not. I absolutely yeah. would not recommend that and would not also recommend stem cells as well that are, you know, un, un, you know, sort of um, regulated because these sorts of things, again, you know, Asian market selling you a cure for Parkinson's at like some markup at, with a cancer drug. This is not a good thing at all. And these are very um, possibly, you know, detrimental drugs to the body. You need, you know, in those trials, patients were monitored very, very closely. And so when we roll them out, when and if we do to patients, there will be intensive, um, you know, sort of counseling. We need to know, make sure that you're otherwise healthy to tolerate, you know, a cancer drug and then intensive monitoring. So please do not be doing any of this stuff on your own. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on acupuncture? Are there any studies specific to Parkinson's? Yeah, that's a good question. So acupuncture, we, so I ran, um, I guess we could call it a think tank. So a group of docs who got together last year, um, movement disorder docs, and there was actually a good group of us who are individually sort of trained in different um, arenas. So I'm kind of the mind body uh, yoga person. Um, Dr. Mishley was there. Uh, John Duda, who's in Philly, is a big nutrition expert. So um, there was uh, a few docs that were um, Benzie Kluger, and um, another uh, doc up in Connecticut, both very knowledgeable about acupuncture. And one of the physicians was actually um, trained in acupuncture. And I think this is a hot topic. So we might actually have a whole session in the next you know, rollout um, on this. But my takeaway is that acupuncture may help with certain types of pain, perhaps with energy level and sleep. But we haven't had any good studies in Parkinson's that have for sure proven that it helps with anything from a pure motor symptom perspective. Um, Dr. Kluger actually did a study um, looking at uh, real acupuncture points versus sham acupuncture points in patients with Parkinson's looking at fatigue, and actually both, both groups got better. <laughs> so there's a huge placebo effect, and who knows? I mean, I think a lot of these um, things are very hard to study in, in the sort of classic way that we do these randomized control trials. So I think that, I personally think uh, that uh, you know, traditional Chinese medicine, which is where acupuncture fits under, if you have access to that in your health, for example, the VA offers it um, to patients. And if you want to give it a try and see how it goes for you, um, you, know, you know, it's not cost prohibitive. I don't think it's harmful. And I think that there's enough possible improvements from these other subtle things that I mentioned that it may be worth giving it a try. But I would certainly, if you feel no different and no benefit I, and you're paying out of pocket, I would certainly, you know, think about it as a trial like you would with medicine and maybe, you know, discontinue it after, you know, a couple months or something like that. But hopefully there'll be better studies that come out, you know, as, uh, as time goes on. Um, but yeah, the, the main studies that we have are not terribly positive at this point and because of that sham issue with, you know, improvement and even the, the non acupuncture points. Yeah. Is the placebo effect more prevalent with people with Parkinson's because it of seems like it is. Yeah. I think that there is. And, you know, I think that there's been a sense, um, 
that yes, Parkinson's patients do seem to have more, um, you know, more uh, placebo effect for whatever reason. And um, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I think that if something's helping you and you feel better, um, even with drugs that trials that we're doing or surgical trials, when we go to re re reproduce them, sometimes we're not able to reproduce them in the same way. And so I think there's a lot of thought that, you know, if patients think that something's new and exciting, or the physicians are thinking something's new and exciting, the, often the trials are a little bit more positive than, you know, if we take time points that are down the road. So I think there has been a sense that Parkinson's patients are have some higher placebo effects. And in some of the surgical interventions, I think some of those effects in the sham surgical groups were like up to 20, 25%. And so it's not until you really, you know, if you have an open label study, so let's just say you get, everybody goes in, everybody knows they're getting the treatment and everybody, the doctor knows they're getting the treatment and the person evaluating knows that they got the treatment. And all of those studies usually look positive in, in every surgical study and every treatment. It's not until you get to these later phases where you're blinding people and you're having a, a control group and things like that. This is in the traditional way of studying it that we really are able to tease out those placebo effects and say, you know, actually 25% of this effect. And that's why we're always comparing the, the, the treatment arm to the placebo arm and we, we subtract the effect because, you know, um, it really is that there's a large placebo effect in, in many, many interventions. And, and the more hands-on, the more you're sticking something in a patient, that placebo effect seems to go up. So it's kind of interesting. It's a great point. I love your optimistic take that maybe that's a great thing in some ways that is. <laughs> I mean, I think ultimately it's about quality of life and feeling better, but I think we also don't want to be doing harmful things. We don't want to be spending all our money on things that are having, you know, really no benefit. And I think we need to be mindful. I want to, again, stress that these treatments are to be undertaken along with, sort of integrated with the classic Western approaches. And I certainly am not somebody who doesn't believe that, you know, I think that dopamine is missing in brains of Parkinson's patients and we need to replace that. And so we would be completely missing the point if we, we're avoiding dopamine replacement and, and doing things that were completely off that grid. So, but I think where we don't move the needle, apathy, for example, what do we have to offer? And this is hugely, you know, a quality of life issue for the patient as well as the caregiver. We really need to be looking outside the box because we haven't found it and people are looking and, you know, it's a very common problem, so. Definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, someone shared a link um, about neurofeedback for balance. So that was back to the question yeah. a, a while back. Mm -hmm. And then um, Ron wanted to know, is infrared light therapy a alternative medicine technique that you know anything about? Yeah. Uh, so I think there's been some interest in um, saunas and infrared sauna type things um, within the sense in the universe of detox. And I think that um, there's been an interest in that across the board from what I see in, in the universe of just driving down the street in LA. Um, so I think that, you know, some of the detox ideas of having, um, you know, people sweat to get rid of toxins is, is in theory a good idea in theory for just a normal person who's young who might be you know, running around. But I think as we age, our um, regulation of blood pressure sent, tends to change. And with Parkinson's disease, some of these things can change. And so I think if you're, if you, I, I would say it would be harmful if you ended up getting so dehydrated that you're, you dropped your blood pressure and then felt bad afterwards. And so I think hydration is important if you're considering trying it. I think that you know, telling them about your disease and having somebody around that can monitor. You don't want to be in a sauna or a spa or whatever, and, or even a hot tub for that matter, um, by yourself and then pass out and have nobody, you know, around. So I think um, I almost view Parkinson's almost like some patients with pregnancy or something like, or with cardiac issues. There's, because the blood pressure regulation is a little weird in our patients, we have to be extra careful with these sorts of things. But you know, if you go in with your son or your spouse and they're there with you and you're hydrating throughout and you feel better afterwards, then, you know, I think that's okay. And again, if it's 
a bazillion dollars, then we have to, you know, reconsider that. But, you know, if you have, if you have something that you'd like to try. And honestly, in some social traditions, um, I was just uh, traveling in Europe. A lot of places have historically had this communal bath or, you know, spa, uh, hot spring, whatever, everybody gets together and they hang out there. And I think, again, if that's a social connection that you can have or with the girls, you know, having a spa day with your with your tribe, girlfriends, whatever, then I think there's some benefit to that. And I wouldn't want you to not be able to participate if that's something that's a group experience. So again, monitoring, hydration, things like that. But there's not really any data showing that it benefits Parkinson's specifically. And I think these are pretty new. The infrared thing is pretty new. So we'll have to see if anyone decides to study that. Okay, so we're gonna have two more questions. I have an easy one and a hard one. Okay. I think this one's easy. See, what about intranasal photobiomodulation that's now used for dementias? Uh, again, I don't, I'm actually not too aware of that. I wanna be honest, I think that's pretty new. Um, I don't think it's been used in Parkinson's. Intranasal photobiomodulation. I'm trying to think how that would even work. Um, so is that some sort of light that you're, I, I honestly am not sure about that. I apologize, but um, you know, maybe if we have a speaker later who's more in these areas, we can ask them. It sounds like there's a lot of questions in this field, so that's exciting. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and I'm gonna end with the hard question I've been saving. What if um, our audience out there, what if their neurologist or even their primary care physician isn't as you know um, open as you are, and maybe yeah. is more you know traditional um, yeah. medication based. Yeah. How can they have conversations with their doctor about some of these ideas yeah. and not come across as you know I know more than you, doctor? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that hopefully we'll change things slowly on the other side. So hopefully, as as we as a community of doctors realize that there, where well, you don't have all the answers um, from traditional medicine, you know, Western medicine, hopefully we'll start to change our, our minds a little bit. We are, as a community, starting to expand our horizons as doctors who are movement disorders. So there's, you know, a number of us on the fringe, we feel like, but we're getting together in groups and hopefully starting to present things in meetings. And I think as small studies come out, as there's a group of patient interest as well, doctors can't help but to care about this if every patient out there is like we want answers and we want this highlighted and we want speakers on this topic so i think you guys as, as advocacy groups and as pa individual patients as part of that empowerment need to say we don't care about the net the like fifth lecture on this you know whatever uh day of whatever parkinson's day or whatever it is um, about, you know, the same drug that we already heard about last year. We want something different. And so asking the questions and, and as a community, bringing forth this interest is really key because if it's not brought forth and everyone's quiet and they keep it all to themselves and secretly are doing it, then that's going to be a problem. So we're trying to educate physicians, movement disorder physicians about the, the interest as, from patients and the need to care about this, um, just as a, a community of doctors. But, and also we're trying to go into the integrative medicine, for example, Dr. Mishley and I are presenting at an integrative medicine meeting coming up in October. So we'll be teaching the integrative medicine docs also about Parkinson's, because part of the issue is that you may not want to go to these other MDs that are integrative medicine docs, because this is now a fellowship and a real thing, because they don't know anything about Parkinson's, right? But once you may have a doctor that knows about Parkinson's, maybe then, you know, if they know about Parkinson's, they can start a communication between the internal medicine, you know, the, the, the movement doc and them. And so, you know, this patient came to me and they, you know, I was considering these, what do you think? And then a doctor can also start, you know, because I think a lot of folks, either they're time crunched or they're just don't, they don't feel comfortable with the information, the knowledge that they have to really provide real information. So they kind of shut it down. You know, it's often, it's not that they don't care about you as a patient. It's just that they don't feel comfortable, honestly, probably having that conversation. So I think, you know, and if you have a choice, maybe ask around, maybe, you know, if you have support groups that you go to say, you know, I'm interested in this, are there other patients that are interested? Which doctor do you go to? And are they open to at least the discussion? And then the last point that I would say is that um, Monique Giroux, who um, it's G-I-R-O-U-X, um, we might have her on in the next uh, round as well. 
Um, she wrote a book on, I think it was called like Living Well with Parkinson's or something like that. She's a movement doc and she actually at the back has some resources about how to um, bring this up with your doctor and a few, you know, ways to document things and, you know, sort of some, some tools to help. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to put some of these resources up eventually either um, at uh, um, certain advocacy groups as well. So, so stay tuned. I think this is something that I think people do want to help patients be able to communicate better. Um, so, and you don't want to get, if you go to a doctor's office and you have a visit that feels like you've basically been beaten up by the other person, or you're not talking to them about anything because they don't get you, then, you know, maybe that's not a therapeutic relationship. I mean, you know, and I, I'm not a doctor for everybody, believe me, there's, you know, patients that we don't jive, you know, and so, you know, maybe I refer them to a different colleague. I mean, you know, in 20 years, that's going to happen here and there, but you know, so it's important to really feel connected because this is a person who's going to be holding your hand for decades of this disease. And if you can have an ally that's a movement disorder doc, for example, um, maybe if it's at a distance, check in with them once a year and just, you know, kind of um, figure out what your game plan is for the year, go back to your regular neurologist or something like that. But there's definitely roles for all of these, you know, subspecialty trained doctors, an integrative medicine doctor, a movement disorder doctor, you know, in, in the treatment team. Great advice and a great way to, to close out our questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Subramanian, for sharing your time and your expertise. And thank you for the work that you're doing to push the envelope and to you know, um, uh, you know, start to have, like you mentioned, some of um, you know, traditional Western doctors look beyond. And challenge accepted, we will continue um, to not settle for uh, the usual, um, you know, uh, drug-based talks or whatnot, and also to all of you out there, challenge you again to um, advocate that to your physicians and so we can make these voices heard and, and move the needle. And in closing, um, since there's been lots of research about how a lot of the, the good things about um, socialization is, you know, the uh, and social connection is the eye contact. So I want to see if everyone would start their video. So turn off, you, some of you have it hidden so you could eat your lunch or whatever. <laughs> I want to see if you'll hit the button to start your video so we can see your shining faces. And then if you, in the, on, on my Mac, in the upper right hand corner, you can either hit speaker view or gallery view. And gallery view is kind of cool because then you see all of the little boxes of everyone. Oh, I see some boxes coming online. So mm -hmm. I want everyone to just, you know, look into the camera and wave or do something silly and know that we're all out here. Um, I saw the, some of the sign-ins, so from the East Coast to California. Um, good to see all your faces. Thank you for joining. Oh, I love more people are turning it on. So um, thank you all.